Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hope you guys are enjoying your lunch. How's everybody doing today? Going well? All right. So my name is Shannon Poon. I, uh, I am in uh, Intel's data center group, and, uh, and I run our uh, segment of the market that we have that calls on enterprise IT. So we spent a lot of time working with, uh, with a lot of customers like yourself. And I'll give you a little, uh, hopefully, a little lunchtime uh, entertainment. I'll go through, uh, go through some slides that we have uh, around what we're looking to do to transform the data center. Some of this you've heard you know, from some of the Intel folks that have been here and been on stage. And, and hopefully, some of it will be a little, bit, uh, a little bit more futuristic or a little bit of a different perspective. Before I get started, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to kick it off with a video. Um, I told my team to put, uh, you know, put something a little uh, creative together, uh, spare no expense, bring in some Hollywood talent, and kind of tell the story of what it's like to, uh, to be one of the end users like yourself who are looking to deploy uh, workloads in a cloud environment. So I uh, haven't yet seen the video, so we'll see what it looks like. But uh, if we could roll that video, please. Imagine this. You're shopping for a new set of wheels. You spot your dream car and examine the sticker. But it doesn't say anything about the horsepower, the miles per gallon, the safety features. But you can't beat the price. You decide to go for it. You get it out on the highway and look down to discover your dashboard has no gauges, no speedometer, no fuel gauge, no tachometer, not even turn signals. Not ideal. To make matters worse, every day your car is a different size and shape. Sometimes you can't even get out of the garage. That's it, you're done. This scenario in some ways resembles the experience of shopping for cloud solutions and services today. From service performance to security SLAs, it's anyone's guess what you'll get. Working together, we can do better. Because with transparency and service and infrastructure capability, your company will be taking the on-ramp to the cloud in no time. OK, so probably not going to win an Academy Award anytime soon. But uh, it, it does kind of illustrate a little bit uh, about the challenges that I think you guys are trying to address here with ODCA, some of the, some of the things that you guys are looking at in terms of uh, SLAs, capability, ability to actually get a, uh, a cloud environment deployed uh, fairly rapidly. One of the quotes that I love um, you know, has been it, it, a, a bunch of folks have looked at futurists and some of the things that they predict. And I, I always really love this one, uh, William Gibson talking about how the future's you know, uh, uh, already here. It's just not evenly dispersed. You see a number of different cases where I think many of you are out there deploying infrastructure or looking at deploying workloads. And there are people who are doing that in production, in cloud environments today. It's just not uh, distributed into the masses yet. So we've you know, kind of taken, I'll, I'll take that as part of a little bit of a theme here, to talk about what we Intel are seeing in terms of what people are deploying and how we might take ODCA, some of the work that you guys are, some of the great work that you guys are doing, and help to bring that to the masses. One of the ones that I wanted to show was, you know, you look at, you look at environments, uh, you know, rural environments, city environments. You look at just kind of the way that, um, the way that people are migrating uh, more and more each day uh, around the world. What we're seeing is we're seeing a, a desire for many people to move up socioeconomically. What we're also seeing is that's driving a lot of technology usage, right? So what, what, from an Intel perspective, we're obviously you know, out there working very closely with folks trying to seamlessly deploy some of this new technology. And what that means to us is we need to, we need to work with standards. We need to work on knocking down some of those technology barriers. This is an example, obviously, of Shanghai and farming. But I mean, you could take this, you could take this, uh, this example of distributing the future to almost, any, to almost any end. One of the other things that we've looked at is, you know, if you look at different, the way different industries have been transformed. On the left-hand side of this, you can see individual assembly of vehicles before there was automation and assembly line production of vehicles. 
it wasn't like, you know, once somebody saw Henry Ford's factory and said, okay, I can see what people are doing to, to mass produce stuff. It wasn't like this was, you know, incredibly revolutionary from the concept of they go in the factory, they see it, and they go, okay, I see how this is done. They then need to take that back to their own company and say, what does that mean for me? How do I internalize that? Right? How do I transform my processes, my company, my capability to take some of the things that you can see plain as day in front of you and make it reality? There are companies in history that were able to transform, and they were able to capture more market share, and they were able to thrive. Likewise, there are companies, probably entire industries, that weren't able to transform. They could see the future, they couldn't necessarily get it implemented, and they didn't survive. And I think you're going to see some of the same things in this shakeup of, of what's going on in the IT industry. I've been doing this for about 15 years in the data center group. I know many of you have been doing it for a lot longer. There's probably never been a more exciting time to be uh, in IT. I know virtualization was interesting for a lot of us uh, within Intel. The competitive uh, you know, environment that we had um, in the mid-2000s was fairly interesting. But I think right now, when you look at some of the changes that are happening in our space, it's pretty amazing to see all of the different things anywhere from orchestration software to virtualizing compute network and storage to changing actually some of the, some of the way that companies are actually organized. You're seeing folks like AT&T go out and say, John Donovan just, uh, just last week went out and said, they're transforming the culture of the company, they're transforming the organizational structure of the company in order for them to be able to move into an era where they need to rapidly adopt cloud. I think many of you company-wise are in some similar situations. And I think there are examples of where we can see the future, but getting it implemented in your own companies is one of the big hurdles that we see out there. We think the, you know, getting the future implemented across the data centers is true today. You can see some of those very large hyperscale data centers that exist, right? They're automated. They deploy workloads rapidly. They can scale really well. They're responsive, right? So there are some capabilities that exist out there. At the same time, when I go out and talk to a lot of you, the data centers that you have, they were maybe built for a different purpose. They weren't built with as a service in mind. You know, they weren't necessarily, they were built maybe a little more for, for stability, right? As opposed to being able to scale rapidly up and down, to be able to move workloads around from one data center to the next, right? So you all are probably in this room or part of ODCA because you're thinking about how do you transform your company, right? How do you capitalize on some of the best practices that this part of the room knows and bring them to that part of the room and vice versa, right? There's a lot of, I think, one of the reasons we love this organization is there's a lot of sharing that can happen, right? There are a lot of capabilities that exist now that some people are doing in prototyping that we need to bring to the masses. One of the other things that we're seeing is, you know, IT and yourself spending a lot of time on keeping the business running. Um, certainly, one of the things that a hyperscale uh, data center provides is a lot more efficient use of capital, use of people, right? The ability to self-provision or automatically deploy workloads, right? So I think there are some things that we can learn from them and now, how do we apply those to the mainstream, right? How do we get the future available to everyone? So that's, I think, one of the, you know, when we look at, at ODCA and, and, its, uh, and its new charter, I think that one of the things that, that makes it so exciting for Intel IT and, and others uh, to be in the organization is we get, to do, we get to do some of that sharing. We're certainly developing some solutions on our side. I think, uh, you know, we've, we've both talked about some of the, capability that we're uh, developing, deploying, but I also think that we're learning as well in this organization, right? We want to take some of the, some of the ideas and, and concepts from you all. It will require change, right? We already know at Intel, we've been uh, deploying a private cloud environment. We've been doing some work with, you know, some of the different orchestration players. Our Intel IT people love to get stuff in and, and, uh, and try it out and prototype it. So I know that they're, you know, they're doing a bunch of that. We also are contributing a lot 
to open source and to enabling partners and others uh, in the industry. Because we feel like that's what it's going to take to move us from where we are today, where the future isn't available to everyone, to where we need to be, where the future will be available for the masses. One of the things that we can see if we go out, um, and, and hopefully this is one of the things that we can, we can also espouse, is we see a lot of the absolute latest hyperscale data centers uh, in the industry. They, are, they end up, I'm, I do uh, product marketing uh, within the data center group, they end up pushing us a lot on the product side. Across compute and network and storage, they're constantly asking us for things that might not be the, you know, it used to be, I could tell you 10 years ago when I ran Xeon products, it was you can have any Xeon you want as long as it's a black one, this one, the one we make, right? We're not going to customize it. We mass produce things. This is the product that you get. Well, that worked fine for us, you know, for a little while, but that doesn't work for us anymore. We're getting a lot of requirements that are being placed on us in terms of how can you modify these products? I need something else. I need more security capability in the products. I want more telemetry coming out of the platform. I want the ability for the software to look down into the platform and say, what is this platform capable of? So as you guys are deploying new infrastructure, you want to make sure that it's future-proof for whatever you might have over the next few years. Right? So there's a lot of, I think, things we can learn, but also a lot of things that Intel is having to change within our own capability and processes to be able to supply uh, products to this new market, this, uh, this public, private, and hybrid cloud market. One of the things that I think shows the maturity of our industry is hopefully you guys have seen some flavor of this from almost every vendor that's out there. I think these, these uh, slides are starting to look the same. Um, I think there are, there are subtle nuances about these slides that make them slightly more interesting depend on which vendor you talk to, whether you're OpenStack Microsoft VMware or whether you're an Intel or whether you're a security software provider or whether you're providing analytics capability, whether you're providing hardware, right? I think the, the slide might have a different meaning to people, you know, depending on what they're doing. To us, a couple things, you know, kind of stick out. Uh, first of all, we know that the underlying infrastructure, the servers, the network, the storage capability, will need to be modified over the next few years. We currently you know, deploy a lot of our designs into server products that are, it's a, it's a 2U, 2P server with a certain number of DIMMs and a certain amount of storage, right, and a certain number of CPUs, right? Why that number? Well, that number was at one point an optimal balance of how much memory you needed, how much I.O. you needed, how much storage you needed, how much compute capacity you needed, right? It's not necessarily you know, fixed in stone that 2U and 2 processor and 24 DIMMs and 20 hard drives is the right number for you to be buying your infrastructure in. So we believe that there's actually going to be a disruption in the data center around the way that people supply you with hardware. You might have the ability in the future over the next five years or so to buy more compute more storage, more memory, more I.O. in the ratio that you need it, right? At the same time, if you think about what's happening with that convergence of, uh, convergence of compute network and storage, we believe that we're going to need to modify our products, our processors, our chipsets, our networking controllers, our non-volatile memory technology to be able to make it more configurable. We know that we're going to have to build capability in there that exposes telemetry out of the platform. You can see infrastructure attributes is a big box for us. We want the hardware to be important and relevant, shocking, right? Um, one of the things that I will say is we're really starting to see pickup of some of the infrastructure capability that we just started to introduce in the new platforms that we launched. So we know that, we know that we're resonating well, hopefully with you all, and I'll get more feedback um, after this discussion. But we know we need to do more to expose that capability to the platform. We're working in standards organizations to be able to put in an API, a RESTful API, to be able to expose some of those attributes so that the orchestration software and the application software can take advantage of it. So we believe that you'll start to see more 
similarities over time as people are talking about you know, a model where they're looking at bringing compute and network and storage hardware uh, more closely together and doing more to orchestrate that compute network and storage hardware. One of the things we've also said is, as you get to a software-defined infrastructure, you need to start to have a different set of methodology around what your hardware is going to do, right? You're going to need to go in there and watch what's happening with the infrastructure. So you need some capability. You need some things to watch, first of all. What are you watching? Those infrastructure attributes. Some of the systems management data that you get out. Some of the applications management data that you get out loading of the systems, you know, different things that you need to achieve a, a certain SLA. So you're going to need to watch more. You're going to need to decide what you want to do, right? So one of the things that you're going to have to do is, okay, I've got a lot of data now. How do I decide what to do with that data? What are my engines that I use to make decisions based on all this data that Intel hopefully is now exposing through the hardware? How do I decide what to do with that data? Next, you need to act. You're going to need to take some sort of action based on the decision that you've made. That is a separate set of capability that needs to be built in. And finally, we believe that your systems are going to need to learn. At first, you'll do a lot of this manually. right? You could argue you do it all manually or most of it manually today. right? But eventually, as you get through this cycle, we believe that you're going to use analytics and you're going to build more and more capability to follow your way through this cycle. right? And I think it'll be less people intensive as you go through this cycle uh, over and over and over again. So we've, you know, we've talked about watch, decide, act, and learn. You'll hear more about it as we build capability in there. I also believe that you're going to see opportunity for innovation in every one, of these, every one of these areas. There are going to be opportunities for companies to come to you because they want to differentiate and offer capability to you around some of these areas. And you're going to then have to decide what do you want to do with that capability that they offer. One of the things around watching, so if we, go, if we go very specifically into it, I talked a little bit about the, the telemetry you know, that we're going to expose. Right? You guys are sitting there saying, I'm going you know, to source some kind of service from a cloud somewhere. I'm going to deploy some kind of service on my own infrastructure. And oftentimes, you have a lot of capability to get that service set up, to provision it, to put it down on a certain set of infrastructure. But then the reality of it is you're not watching it that closely. You know, we've talked about some te technology that we introduced around quality of service of monitoring some of the resources like the cache or some of the capability on the platforms themselves to figure out what happens to a workload after you provision it. Right? What kind of capability does it deliver you know, day 50 if it's still up and running in the same place you originally provisioned it versus day one, minute one, when you first provision that workload? We think that we're going to need to expose some things because there are environmental factors, there are regulatory factors, there are other things that are going to dictate why you might want to move that workload. Right? If you get somebody consuming all of the resources of the server that you happen to land on in a public environment, you're going to want to move that workload. How do you watch? How do you decide? Right? How, do you make it, how do you act and make a capability? And how do you learn to not put it in that spot that way again? Right? So watching, we believe, is going to be incredibly important. We also think that some of the hardware metrics that we need to expose are going to evolve. We start with thermal and CPU utilization. We're now into you know, cache and cache quality of service. We believe that we're going to need to continue to extend our capability and innovate on the platform level. We did some stuff around uh, geolocation and geotag and geofencing of data. Right? So I think that's going to be pretty important for us as we move forward. Security, some of the capability around security. Right? So we want to make sure that we give you as many tools as we can, and we work in conjunction with the hardware partners that you guys are working with, but also with all of the cloud providers that you guys are working with to expose that telemetry and expose that data. So we believe that will be pretty important uh, moving forward. One of the things that we did, we introduced um, 
the latest uh, uh, Xeon CPU, the um, Xeon E5 V3, rolls right off the tongue. Um, the latest generation of our Xeon CPU, uh, we introduced it a, a couple weeks ago, uh, really great. We've had really great pickup on the product. Obviously, uh, we work really hard to deliver great performance and performance per watt. I think that's what people expect. But one of the reasons that we got a lot of accolades because of the telemetry and the data that we exposed out of the platform and some of the things that we started to talk about that were actually beyond the performance of the CPU and the performance per watt of the CPU. You'll continue to see us do more and more of that. We're trying to give you more and more knobs and more and more tools, more things to watch so that you can then decide what to do and then act on it. One of the things around, um, one of the things around deciding is we believe that you'll need to have a certain set of analytics. You'll need to have some kind of capability that says, what, am I, what, are, my, what are the variables that I'm watching and what kind of decision might I want to make? Right? If I have to have the orchestration layer become aware of some of the telemetry data of the hardware, which we believe we will, then we need to build that capability in. We need the software and the workloads that you guys are landing to say, hey, I, you know, I want to land on your cloud, and I would prefer to land on some hardware that can accelerate X, Y, Z, whatever that might be. Floating point capability, graphics offload capability, security functionality. You might want to land a workload in a certain area, a certain part of the world. You need to know that where a server is. The server needs to be able to tell you, or you need to have tools to discover that. Then you need to have the tools to be able to decide, right? You need to have the tools to be able to make some kind of decision that says, I want to take action, right? I, I, have, a, uh, I have a workload that's running on a server. I got a report that said that server now has a noisy neighbor on it that's consuming all the resources, and I'm not getting the performance SLA that I originally wanted. I have to make a decision. You can decide to leave it there. You can decide to move it. Now, I make a decision that I want to move that workload. Okay, I have to have the ability to be able to decide that and figure out what I'm going to do about it, right? So we know that we need to, we know we need, we need to build some of that capability into the platforms. One of the things we did was we introduced something on the, on the new Xeon platform called the Power Thermal Aware Scheduler. So the ability to say, hey, look, this, uh, this server's you know, getting warm, it's not delivering the SLA that I want uh, for the workload that I landed there. I want to give information now so somebody can decide I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move that workload. right? Orchestration layer should be able to make that decision real time. So we need to work with all the orchestration vendors to be able to do that. So we're doing that. right? We're building that capabil capability in. So now we've got the capability to expose a bunch of telemetry out of the platform. We're giving the option now to build that capability into the orchestration layer so that we can get some decisions made. Right? We believe that's incredibly important for us. We think you're also going to want to have some analytics that are going to predict trend data. Right? Maybe I don't have an issue right this minute because you don't want to take, you don't want to act at the last minute every time. You want to predict when you need to act. So one of the things we believe is you're going to see a lot more analytics at use within your data centers in terms of how to schedule and land workloads and move them around. Right? So I think that'll be one of the big pieces of, of capability that we have there. Our own Intel IT folks um, have used that power thermal aware scheduling capability to lower their costs significantly, about 20% uh, lower operating costs when they were using systems with that capability enabled in an orchestrated environment where they could take advantage of it. Right? They're also able to reduce their cooling costs significantly because they were able to actually move workloads around the data center based on policy, based on the analytics that they have, right, and the information that they have coming out of these systems. Next, you got to act, right? We believe that uh, having a very uh, strong capability with the orchestration layer to act is going to be critical moving forward. You've got all the telemetry. You've got the capability now to, to make a decision. But you've got to have an underlying infrastructure that's fast enough and capable enough to act. How do you dynamically reprovision your workloads? What policy and what decision are you setting that says, I've, I've watched 
I've made a decision that I want to move the workload. Now I've got to act. What is your capability to be able to act automatically? Right? We think that you're going to have to build a lot, of, a lot of capability and tools into your infrastructure to be able to make those decisions that are right for your business. The other thing is you guys are going through a lot of decisions about what do I put on-prem, what do I move off-prem? Right? What are your policies there and how do you make those decisions? Assuming it was seamless, seamless, which if it was, you probably all wouldn't be here if it was incredibly seamless. Right? But you're going to have to make some decisions based on where you want your workloads to land. You're going to need capability in your hardware. You need to have enough I.O. and enough network capability. Overall, your hardware is going to have to have enough compute capability to be able to move a workload wherever you want it to go. So we think that'll be incredibly important as well. In the case of a, a, a noisy neighbor, what, what we want to, you know, the example that I had around uh, cache quality, we want to make sure that something like that would happen automatically, right? You would have some policy that says, if I get telemetry data that says I reach a certain threshold, 80% utilization of a system, whatever, that I'm going to move that workload automatically. So you're going to be able to take some of that action, right? seamlessly. And I don't think there's a lot of us in this room. I don't know if Intel IT, as you talk to them, will tell you they're at the point where they're making those kinds of decisions automatically, seamlessly today. Right? We're trying to get there. We're trying to do more. But again, when you think about the future is here and it's available, there are companies out there that are doing it. Right? We're just trying to help make that capability, the ability to watch, decide, and act, available to the masses, right? available to everyone. We think that the intelligence part of this is going to be very important. Um, I talked a little bit about analytics and, and some, of the, some of the capability that, um, that we're doing and, and enabling, but I also think that there's going to be room for uh, pretty good room for innovation in the industry here around what are the tools that you guys need to be able to analyze all of the data that you're getting and, and be able to act on it. I think you're going to see third-party uh, companies, if you haven't already seen third-party companies, that are going to have offerings in that space that look at, at uh, taking analytics and, and big data and, and the telemetry data and all the information coming out of the platforms and then making some sort of decision based on that. So I think that'll be a, I think that'll be a big opportunity for us all in the industry. And then lastly, and probably the one that I think, um, you know, DOS, you guys heard from DOS, one of the guys that was in uh, Intel IT now moved into our data center group. One of the things he talked about um, was the ability to learn, right, from some of the things that are happening in the platform. I think he would probably also admit this one's probably not the furthest one along of watch, decide, and act. You know, very crisp, very clear. We have understandings of how we can get there. And I think that there's examples in the industry talk about the future being here. Uh, not evenly distributed. There's examples in the industry of watch, decide, and act, very tangible examples. I think the learn is a little bit further out there. right? I think this one has a little bit more development to go for us, but the capability is there. The capability is there to, once you make one decision and you decide to act on it, once you do that, you're able to do it again and again and again based on some kind of policy or some kind of capability that you've built. There are folks in this room that are looking at, at ma you know, massive amounts of data and saying, what can I do with all that data and how can I learn from it? It's an ever-changing data set with millions and billions of data points that could come in every day. What do you do based on all that data that you have uh, at your disposal? One of the things we're doing is we're going out and working with uh, industry partners. So we think it's incredibly important to get some orchestration capability out there. You can see some of the, some of the orchestration providers here. Um, and, and you know we're contributing a lot um, to the open source community, but we're also working closely with some of the established uh, software vendors that are out there. We're trying to make it easier to deploy on-premise private clouds and to give you guys good options for hybrid cloud environments. It's one of the things that we passionately believe about as a, as a company. What we're also trying to do, the, uh, the thing like Redfish, how many of you have seen the Redfish? Red, know, what it's, know what it is, know what I'm talking about. 
not the red little thing on the slide. How many of you can read? But uh, so Redfish capability. Um, so this was a, uh, a RESTful API capability that we launched. Think about it as exposing the capability of what was IPMI on the platform through a RESTful API so that the orchestration software or any software above it can actually take advantage of it. Right? So this was a, an effort that we launched at uh, the Intel Developer Forum in conjunction with a couple of other uh, partners. We are going to take that into a standards organization, and we're going to try and see if we can get that standardized. We think that's a, a good idea for the industry. We think the ability to expose that uh, telemetry data and, and get it out there is going to be good uh, for the industry. So that's what this Redfish effort is. If you're not that familiar with it, I would, uh, there were a couple of announcements at IDF, and you can just uh, grab me afterwards. I'd be happy to uh, talk about it for a while. But what we're really trying to do is get some of that telemetry data out of the platform so that orchestration software and other software can take advantage of it. What we're also doing is we're working closely with folks like uh, Cloud Foundry so that we can have some capability, M make it easy. Everything that we're trying to do here is to make it easier to deploy on-premise private clouds and to make it easier to deploy a cloud environment in a, in a hybrid scenario, either one of those. Obviously, some of the public cloud service pro providers are doing great work. They're out there with infrastructure as a service or any of the other you know, types of as a service that you guys are, that you guys are purchasing. Uh, we're working closely with them um, and supplying them with a lot of the technology. But what we really are seeing is you know, the folks in this room are probably having the biggest challenge with deploying on-premise infrastructure. So we're trying to make that a little easier by working with folks like OpenStack very closely, one of the top contributors, Cloud Foundry, same deal. Right? And, and I think the, the good news as you guys are looking at your new charter, I think one of, the, one of the good things about that is our Intel IT folks are the ones that are working with uh, Redfish, with OpenStack, with Cloud Foundry, with others to try and make the capability better because they're using it internally. Right? So they're trying to make it work a whole lot better as well. With that, um, you know, I, I just want to echo a couple of the themes that, that um, you know, ODCA has really been, been driving home, right? And, and I think these are work streams that you guys all have. Um, you know, so for us, we want to try and, and engage very closely uh, with those work streams. So around transparency, you know, it's, we're not just looking for, you know, take any technology, deploy it, you know, here's your, here's your answer. We're really looking for, you know, the right technology that's going to meet the needs of, of what you guys are looking for. We talk about common measures and the ability to measure uh, the capability that's being delivered. We're providing a number of, a number of tools and capability. I, I could tell you from a product roadmap perspective, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg of what we, can, of what we think we're going to be uh, providing uh, into those platforms in the future. So I think that's pretty interesting. There isn't really, you think about like, the way that you measure performance of a cloud. Right? How do you do that today? Right? We need to provide some capabilities, so some hooks in the hardware to be able to measure some of the things that are, that are, uh, are happening there. We know about the requirement for interoperability. We know that's limiting a lot of what could be more robust cloud deployments and adoptions. And a lot of people think it's, it's on-premise private clouds versus off-premise public clouds. It's not just that, right? There's actually interoperability issues across the gamut of, of even one company with their own interoperability issues. So we're trying to help figure out how can we, you know, how can we solve those. Portability of data, not just moving the application, but moving the data. Um, you know, you guys know what's going on around the world in Singapore and, uh, you know, location of data and citizen data and some of the regulatory uh, environment, um, you know, that's getting established. Even, you could argue, some of the political environment that will probably uh, get worse before it gets better, right? So portability of, of applications and data are going to be a big issue. And then around security, um, you know, all the studies, whenever we ask you guys, what's the number one reason inhibiting cloud adoption? Security is one of the top two issues, you know, almost always one of the top two issues. So for us, we need to do more, right? We need to have the ability, we put some capability into the, into the processors and platforms and chipsets today around trusted execution, some of the things that you can do to attest the capability of a server 
Um, so we've, we've done some things there. There's a lot more that we can do. And we need to work with some, some of the software partners that we have to bring that capability out into the market. So I think you'll see a lot more uh, from Intel in these, in these five areas. And we're you know, incredibly, incredibly happy to be working with ODC on, CA on making progress of them. Lastly, uh, last slide, I believe this organization is unique. Uh, I believe it's unique for the reason that I come and talk to you and you're all end users. Right? I talk to a lot of industry partners who have the same orchestration and network compute storage slide that we have and everybody's got their, their section of the, of the charts always the biggest and you know exactly where they're gonna be motivated. Right? When I talk to you guys, it's a, it's a much more pure discussion. Most of you want things to work. You want the ability to deploy things seamlessly and many of you are sitting here saying, I can see somebody doing something. I need to figure out how I do that in my infrastructure. I need to figure out, like, I, I, I used the AT&T John Donovan example earlier. Major, major reorg within the company. Their business is obviously running a carrier network, right? That's one of their businesses. Right? And, and the largest revenue source, I would add, uh, for them. They had to go through a number of, of changes. And I, I know, you know we've got some other telcos here um, and carriers here on, on ODCA. You, that is their business. That's the core of their business. But look at the changes that they've had to go through just to try and get a cloud environment deployed because of many of the political silos that they have around separation of compute network, storage, manageability, some of the capability that they now, they have to do entire new workflows. Maybe I don't roll a truck anymore. Maybe now I'm, I, am I generating a ticket? Am I, you know, what are the, what are the structural things that they need to change about, about their business that they need to do to be able to move forward, right? Many of you are probably wrestling with some of those similar issues, and I think ODCA is so unique in that you can get together and talk best known methods with other colleagues and try and figure out how they're solving some of the problems that you have. So it's one of the reasons we're, you know, we Intel are just one of the, one of the big supporters there. So with that, I'd like to say thank you guys for your time. I also will uh, take some Q&A if there's any uh, questions and answers. A few uh, ground rules, I will answer any question you ask. It may not be the right answer, but I will uh, do my best. Anything about competition, direction of our data center business, where Intel's going, anything you want to know personal, I'm happy to give those details too. So uh, any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so I mentioned auto automation and orchestration. Do we view uh, resiliency, redundancy to be a part of that value proposition as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so a couple things, right? First of all, we're innovating on the platform level to try and put more uh, redundancy on the hardware. But the reality of it is I think you guys are very capable of building in uh, redundancy and failover in some of the things that you do once you get to a, uh, a private cloud environment. So I think we need to do more to look at what are, the, what are the capabilities that you guys are deploying? Or let's say you're deploying an orchestration layer and you have the ability to watch now a, uh, a, a workload that you've deployed and there is some kind of flag, whatever that flag might be. We want to provide the telemetry and the ability for you to be able to predict that there's going to be a problem and move that before there's a problem. I've increased the resiliency and redundancy of your platform. The reality of it is we didn't change a lot on the hardware side other than give you the, da the data and the ability to make that decision, right? But we prevented you from getting a failure and we helped you pseudo recover. You didn't even have to recover, but we helped you avoid a failure and get back up and running in a different area before it even happened. I believe that improves your resiliency and redundancy. We're gonna do a lot more of that. On the hardware side, we actually are doing some things to build in more, redu uh, more redundant capability on the hardware as well. Generally, though, I, I think what you're seeing is you're seeing a lot more of that capability being built into software than you are the let's all go to the mainframe-like redundant architecture, you know, kind of the way that things were done 10 or 15 years ago. I think that, uh, you know, that part 
has changed a little bit, and I think there's a lot more redundancy capability in the software side. Yeah. How can Intel compete in GPUs? How can Intel compete in GPUs? Um, so first off, we don't make. Rendering. Yeah, yeah. So first off, we don't make, uh, as you know, uh, standalone graphics processors. So if you asked GPU, so I'll answer the graphics processing one, and then I'll answer a compute offload one too. So um, on the GPU side, we're doing some things to build graphics capability into the CPUs. So we have gen, gen graphics uh, capability built into our CPUs. We have that capability in one socket servers today. We're you know, investigating whether it makes sense to expand that. Right now, when we look at the market, we see you know, there are pockets in the market, media transcoding, a huge part of the business. Um, you know, for now, we want to first expose that capability. If you have a GPU workload, first we want to help you deploy a private cloud environment. Secondly, we want to help enable the orchestration and the hardware to be able to say, I have a system with a GPU in it. Because guess what? If you orchestrate a workload onto regular hardware that has no awareness of a GPU being in a server, you won't use the GPU. Third, we want to then provide some capability of accelerating that workload on the platform. So we can do it in one socket today. We're exploring it uh, beyond that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a market, any piece of silicon market is a market that we look at uh, pretty closely. I won't, I won't announce any plans, but obviously we're looking at it very closely. On the compute offload side, we have the Xeon Phi uh, product. So we have a very high core count Xeon Phi product used mostly in high performance computing workloads today. A very, uh, a very uh, capable floating point acceleration or integer acceleration capability that goes into a platform. For you, if you deploy it in a cloud environment, you better have orchestration software that says, I have a workload that needs extra floating point and needs extra integer performance. I will land it on a machine that has a Xeon Phi in it. So there's a lot of capability that needs to be built up to be able to do that. So on the silicon side, I think um, you know, long term, you know, you'll see us uh, continue to watch that market and maybe we'll change our, change our plans and invest a little bit more. Um, in the short term, we're trying to enable the capability to be able to use the technology that you put in the platforms when you deploy a private cloud. Shannon, we've got a couple questions in the back. Okie dokie. Um, <clears throat> um, very nice talk. Um, compliments of, uh, sorry, contributions of Intel are very fundamental to this era um, of IT. Uh, my question is, we all know how you affected the high-end server market with the virtualization, advent of virtual switch, introduction of development kits like DPDK. Yeah. Do you expect networking to go the same way? Yeah. And uh, I have one more question. Sure. And there is a great deal of um, discussion on orchestration, service chaining, and things of that kind. Networking wasn't a very simple thing. It is quite complex. When you're looking at large data centers, large clouds, who are all getting integrated, just the orchestration as a concept makes sense. But how it affects the plumbing, how much compilation needs to be done for things to work end to end, can you address or can you discuss any research that may have gone on at Intel. Thank you. Sure. So a couple things. Um, so the first one, uh, virtualization, right, five, seven years ago, right, we remember virtualization getting rolled out, and it was, you know, we had, we went from one app per server, which was great for hardware business, by the way, um, to multiple applications on an individual server with virtualization. And folks said, hey, this is really going to negatively impact your business. And we stood back and said, we can either disrupt ourselves, stick our head in the sand, or we can act. Right? We decided to act. We enabled virtualization. We made the performance in a virtualized environment better. We lowered the overhead. And lo and behold, you all started to deploy virtual machines like they were going out of style. Right? It used to be to get an IP address and get a server up and running took you know, weeks, whatever. You guys had to order the system, rack it up, cable it up. Now it's like, hey, you want a, you want a virtual machine? Here you go. And guess what? You used a lot more of them, and you used a lot more compute. You also bought more richly configured servers. As you were deploying more and more workloads on one server, 
you wanted it to have more resiliency capability, you wanted it to have more performance, you ended up buying you know, higher up in the, in the stack in terms of the capability of the product. So that all was good for us. Virtualization was all very good for us. Now where are we in networking? Right? Net you guys all deploy a lot of network appliances, firewalls, you know, any load balancing. You guys, you guys have tons of appliances in your, in your infrastructure. We estimate that that market is about a $16 billion market uh, in terms of the silicon that goes inside those boxes. So it's pretty material. It's almost all appliance-based today. You guys know the players in that market. They're looking at you know, their own market, and they're saying, what's going what's to happen as people move more and more to Intel architecture? Right? As people want to virtualize more and more, there's two things that happen. One, we're working really hard to try and get into those, those uh, appliances. Right? We, have a, we have a group that's off uh, providing Atom or Xeon CPUs to go win those appliance boxes, those firewalls, routers, switches, DPDK, everything that we're trying to do um, to be able to get into the network space. So we have that, that capability out there, and we're off enabling that market. And right now, quite candidly, we're a very small percentage of the market, about 5% of the application processors in that $16 billion market. So we think it's a good opportunity you know, for us to go target. Now, what you all should be looking at is, what can I do once I virtualize those workloads and I run them in a cloud environment? Do I still need that appliance, that dedicated appliance hardware in location one? You know, so then if I do move a workload to location two, I need to make sure I have the right appliance there, or I have to reconfigure my network. Or, so this is a transition kind of like you know, we see virtualization you know, was a transition that took five to seven years. I think virtualizing of the networks, not just network functions, but just overall virtualization of the network and some of the things that software-defined networking, networking can do, I think that's going to take a, a, a long period of time. Maybe it's five to seven years. What we are seeing is we are seeing many of the carriers and many of the telco companies leading the way here. It is their business. They believe they can get operational efficiency if they can deliver capability you know, better, faster, cheaper. Right? So I think you're going to see, first of all, we're trying to win it two ways. One, we're trying to win all the appliances and win all the silicon business that we can win. Two, we're trying to help you virtualize networks and get to the point where you're running things as a virtual machine on your cloud environment. Maybe is the future there today? Right? For some people, maybe the future's, you know, you can kind of see the future. Maybe you can't. Right? Um, so I, I think that there's some capability. Now, we didn't even double click on software to find storage. Right? That's another area right, that is probably you know, ripe for some level of disruptive capability. You see a lot of startup activity around SD, SDS controllers and some of the capability in those markets. But I don't know that we say, oh, the future's definitely there. And yet, you go to some of the very large hyperscale data centers and they're doing some pretty innovative things with software to find storage. So I think, um, you know, hopefully the, that, got the, that got the networking, uh, you know, part of, the, part of the question there. Okay. We've got one more in the back. Yeah. Mike Brizzoni with Man and uh, with Camp Marketing. Hey. Uh, hello. So I heard Intel's going to work with the ecosystem on software management. I heard from an orchestration standpoint, some of that software management is going to ensure that the user is aware that there are GPUs in the cloud that they could put to work for them. I heard in the beginning of your, your talk that we're stuck with these dinosaur 2P and 4P systems uh, whose chassis and system design really hasn't changed in a decade. And I'm wondering who's going to pay for their evolution when the integrator base, when the IDM base is stuck with between 5 and 8% net margins. And as a hardware person, I was wondering if you could perhaps light in some other areas, and I'll just pull some up, and maybe you can uh, add your vision as you did in relation to the, the GPU acceleration. Other forms of acceleration, what's Xeon going to use an FPGA for sitting on top of the package? 
How is Intel going to address NVMe DIMM? How is Intel going to address processing and flash arrays? How is Intel going to address high-speed interconnects? Disaggregation and density. And by the way, those V3s are between, what, 10 and 25 percent more power hungry than their predecessor. Am I really getting the added thread performance and how do I tell? Okay, short question. Um, <laughs> let, me, uh, let, me, let me do this. First of all, the capability around GPUs, it's not just that we want to expose GPU capability. You mentioned a couple other things. Um, Non-volatile memory, some of the things that we're doing around networking, um, I would add some of the things we're doing around storage. So let me give you a couple examples. We're building encryption capability, encryption decryption acceleration capability into the instruction set of the architecture of the CPU. If the orchestration layer doesn't know about it, it can't place a workload that needs that capability, it doesn't help us. We're going to build non-volatile memory beyond an SSD into the platform. If the orchestration layer doesn't know about it in the hardware, it doesn't do you any good because you don't know what capability you're looking for out of landing a workload in one spot or another. GPUs and graphics acceleration were there on one socket today. You know, maybe we'll do a little bit more in the future. So again, graphics capability. Networking acceleration. We bought companies that'll do deep packet inspection. So we want the ability as you're doing a deployment of a switching and routing workload in the future, or even if you're buying your hardware today thinking you might do one of those in the future and you want it investment protected, we want the ability to accelerate the processing of a packet, thus we need to expose that to the orchestration layer. So all of those are capabilities that we're thinking about and we're going to expose to the orchestration layer. FPGA, one of the things that we are recognizing is you all and the, the ecosystem of, of application developers are incredibly creative. We can't accelerate every single thing that you want to do and bake it into our silicon four years in advance and drop it on your door four years later and say, ta-da, it's exactly what you wanted at exactly the right time. So we need the capability, we believe, to have configuration on the processor itself so that you can take some of your code, put it inside of a package with a CPU and an FPGA, and be able to accelerate your workloads. Obviously, we're going to have to expose that to the orchestration layer so it knows what the heck's going on with a CPU that's got two brains kind of thing, right? So we know that we're going to need to build that capability in there. So we're building a Xeon CPU with an FPGA in it, and we talked about you know, some of the capability that we think that'll give us. So we're looking at all the, you know, we're looking at all those areas. You asked one more question, which is around ecosystem players today. The, I think you called it dinosaur 2P and 4P platforms. Um, your word's not mine, by the way. Um, one of the things that we're certainly, you know, we're certainly out there talking about is the disaggregation of compute, network, storage, and memory. We have a concept called rack scale architecture. Think of it as a concept car, right, that we've said, look, Here's one way that you could disaggregate those features and functionality. There are many others, and there's plenty of room for innovation in the industry to go do something like that. The reality of it is the footprint of our business is changing a little bit, right? We used to have a very high concentration of our business, our data center business, in the hands of a very few hardware providers. That's now a bit more of a diverse ecosystem so there are other hardware providers that are, that are kind of emerging. Many of them are in the cloud or being driven by the public cloud environment, right? So I, I think the answer to your question is we're going to see. We're going to see who's going to innovate because I think those are the people that are going to thrive in the future. And then we're going to see the ones that are trying to, you know, long for the days gone by. And just like I talked about the, you know, the, the future, you know, not being evenly distributed, I think you can see, you, you, we're starting to get a lens into what some of that future might look like. It's disaggregated compute network and storage. It's orchestrated, accelerated hardware. Maybe everybody in this room can't do it today, but there are some people that can do pockets of it on the planet. And I think we're going to get, I think we're going to get there a lot sooner, a lot sooner than we think. I, I do think, like I said, I think it's an exciting time to be in IT. Those are the reasons why there's lots of unique ways that people can innovate around solutions in terms of what they bring to market to hopefully satisfy the needs that you guys have. I think, I think we're out of time for questions. Okay. Thank you guys very much.